Good afternoon, everybody. This is Dr. Carolyn Hall, Coordinator of Assessment and Continuous Improvement at Cheney University. And today's workshop is called Assessing Critical Thinking, a Soft Skill with Major Impact. Assessing Critical Thinking, a Soft Skill with Major Impact. Um, this particular workshop is extremely important because one of the major um, issues that many professors face when dealing with uh, um, first and second year students is teaching them how to be critical thinkers and analytical in their approaches um, of the text that they deal with in class and even in terms of their writing. So in order for us to, uh, to in order for us to really, really sort of gauge our students' critical thinking and promote critical thinking as a very, very real and needed concept, we got to find a way to assess critical thinking. We've got to find a way to assess critical thinking. Why is this important? Because if we want to improve um, the way that our students uh, look at information and the way they are able to analyze and think about things, then we've got to know where they are in an effort to take them where we desire for them to go. So the first thing I want to talk about, I want to sort of give us an idea of why critical thinking is so important. Um, so on the screen you see before you, critical thinking is a high priority outcome of higher education. Critical thinking skills are crucial for independent thinking and problem, problem solving in both our students' professional and personal lives. Let me say this. You know, in a recent article um, by Newsweek, one of the things that employers say that they're looking for in their new hires is critical thinking skills because we're seeing that more and more people uh, are entering the workforce not able to be uh, thoughtful and analytical when it comes to their job. And so companies are looking for people that are able to, uh, to think critically because these are the people who become the driving force behind comp company visions. And so we want to make sure that we instill that skill within our students, even though it may be thought of as a soft skill, it is still extremely important for not only their collegiate success, but also their future success as professionals. So part of the critical thinking process, part of, a very, very big part of the critical thinking process is what is called metacognition, okay? Um, metacognition and critical thinking actually go hand in hand. Metacognition and critical thinking go hand in hand, right? Metacognition is simply when we teach um, how to think about what we're thinking, right? We're teaching how to think about what we're thinking. This goes hand in hand with critical thinking because critical thinking really allows us to not just read between the lines, but to assess what, what is meant by what was said. It gives our students a, a chance to really, really comprehend and not summarize the things that they've been learning. Right. We want to, we want to make sure that our students that as they're learning, they see the connection between what they're learning. They see the applicability of what they're learning. And so the first thing, even before we get into critical thinking, we've got to teach them metacognitive processes. Metacognition simply means to think about what you're thinking. So here on the screen, I've got a more concrete and elongated definition that says metacognition refers to the processes used to monitor, plan, and assess one's understanding and performance. Metacognition includes a critical awareness of one's thinking and learning and oneself as a thinker and learner. Think about it like this, right? How many times have we had students that have a very, very strong opinion about a text that they've read or some concept that we've discussed in class. 
and they and you you wonder why you know why do they seem so emotionally attached or emotionally invested well when we teach our students to think metacognitively they begin to ask themselves why am i thinking the way that i'm thinking why do i feel the way that i feel about this particular text what sort of outside attachments have i brought in that have begun to shape the way that I'm thinking, right? And so this becomes a, a, a really intricate part of the critical thinking process because it not only teaches them to be uh, um, thinkers, but thought processors. They begin to be very, very introspective in their thought processes and see how it is that they've attached themselves to different belief systems, which then begin to color what it is that they're learning. So before we even move into the realm of, of critical thinking, we want to make sure that we have metacognitive practices in place in our classroom. We want to make sure that we have metacognitive practices in place in our classroom. Extremely important because again, it's like the chicken, the, 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 the chicken that came before the egg, right? Got to have a chicken to have an egg. So which one, which came first, the chicken or the egg? Well, in this case, metacognition is the chicken and critical thinking is the egg that came forth. So we wanna make sure that we have metacognitive practices in place in our classroom that lead our students to the soft skill that is critical thinking, right? So the first practice I wanna have in place is I wanna make sure that I always have pre-assessments. A pre-assessment sorta of is a, a briefing or an overview other thing before we even get started with whatever our lesson is, right? So it's encouraging our students, pre-assessments really sort of encourage our students to think about what they already know before they get started with what they're about to do. Okay, again, I'll say that a pre-assessment encourages our students to think about what they already know before they get started on learning what they're about to do. And so by bringing in these previous attachments, when we cause our students to think about what they already know, they we, 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 we empower them because what they begin to understand is they already bring some level of understanding to a new area right? They already bring some level of understanding to this new area that they're about to delve into. I'll give you an example. One of the things that, uh, that students struggle with um, when they first get to college, many students, especially first-generation college students, when they get to college, one of the biggest struggles is college-level essays, right? Because Previously in high school and secondary school, many of the essays that they have written, most of the essays that they've written have been summarizations of the things that they've read. When they get to college, they're expected to complete analysis papers, which are usually papers that are in response to what they read, papers that would ask for their thoughts or opinions about what is happening in a particular text. It's very different than a summary because analysis implies that there's a level of comprehension there, right? There's a level of comprehension there. So when we get started with this pre-assessment, we should have some sort of questions that we plug in for our students to be constantly asking every time that they're, they get, they're getting ready to read something, right? Uh, for example, whenever I would have my students to read, I always make sure that they read the bio of the author and they read the preface of the work. Don't, don't, don't skim through that information because what happens is, is that gives them some background of what they're about to read. Say for instance, if they read uh, Alice Walker's Color Purple, right? That even though uh, Miss Walker wrote this book in the early eighties and it was made into a movie in 1983, we understand that Miss Walker grew up in the 50s and 60s, and she wrote this text about a rural Southern family, a rural Southern family. And so we also understand that Miss Walker, from reading her biography, grew up in the rural South. So what happens is we know what was happening in the 1950s. Jim Crow, a lot of racism, um, 
Many of these families had never been exposed to urban life. They lived on farms. A lot of them were sharecroppers. And so these are things that we already know about what was happening at that time. So when we go through these things with our students, they bring, a, they bring some level of understanding to the text. So when they read about a woman like Seeley or Suge Avery, who was unable to make, who seemed in the beginning unable to make a life without the help of a man and having very limited choices, they understand it more because they already have some knowledge of what, what is happening during that time frame before they ever read the book. And so this is a metacognitive practices. Why am I thinking like that? Why is the author writing like this, right? Before they even get into it. The next one, Another metacognitive practice we want to put in place in our classroom is what is called the muddiest point, the muddiest point. What does the muddiest point do? Understanding the muddiest point means that we're encouraging our students to identify areas that may be confusing in what we've explored in class or what they've explored in their reading, right? Now, this is important because more often than not, we see students who will completely shut down and stop an assignment altogether because they don't understand. Well, if they're encouraged, if they're encouraged to bring forth what it is that is ambiguous to them or confusing to them, what happens is we have a better chance of bringing clarity to the misunderstanding or confusion. And they have, as scholars, now a better understanding of how to get an understanding, right? And they can process this misunderstanding by bringing what they don't understand to light. Next type of metacognitive practice is retrospective post-assessment, a retrospective post-assessment. This is when we push our students to really think about how much they've grown, uh, how much they've grown in their educational processes, right? So when I started molecular biology, this may be a, a conversation that we assess. This may be a short writing assignment where we assess. It may be a short group project where we assess. Students can talk about what it is that they knew at the beginning, which is probably not much, where versus what they know now. And this, this lets them know how much they have evolved during the course of the class and how much they've grown. And so this becomes a challenge for them. So now that we have these metacognitive practices in place, right? Now that we have these metacognitive practices in place and we've taught students to think about what they're thinking and be introspective in their thought processes, now we really can push them into a place where they become critical thinkers on their own. We can push them to a place where we teach them how to be critical thinkers on their own. But some of this, we need to make sure that we're infusing in our daily class discussions and also infusing in their homework assignments and group projects, right? Because if you know that when you give an answer in class, your teacher is going to ask why, or can you explain yourself, right? which is the essence of critical thinking, then you're going to do more than just skim articles. You're going to do more than just uh, read enough to pass the test. You're going to make sure that you're reading for comprehension. So I want to give you these, these, these tactics that we use to help our students understand that critical thinking is a multidimensional construct. It's not just... Um, not just comprehension, but it involves being able to accurately and thoroughly interpret evidence. It means that when I'm reading, I'm asking relevant questions, questions that are relevant to the topic at hand. Um, I'm able to draw insightful and reasonable conclusions. I'm able to, to justify what I believe about something or about a text. So if I have a particular point of view, I'm able to back up that point of view by specific examples that the author may give or that come forth in whatever film that we watch. I'm able to evaluate key information. And I'm also able to understand that though somebody may have a differing point of view, if they're able to back up that point of view, that there may be validity 
and what they have to say, even if I don't agree with it, right? Because if we're really uh, uh, trying to create scholars who are critical thinkers, they also understand that I don't, I may not agree with everything, but as a scholar, I need to understand issues from a multitude of sides. That doesn't mean that I take a multitude of points. That just means that I understand that people have differing points of view that I may not agree with, but they still have validity. So when I'm assessing the critical thinking of my students, I want to make sure that my assessment is always aligned with my instructional focus. I want to make sure that my assessment is always aligned with my instructional focus. What does that look like, Dr. Hall? Well, what that means is if I am teaching students how to write a uh, if I'm teaching students how to write research papers, right? If I'm teaching students how to make uh, uh, to, to, to write research papers, that when I'm grading that research paper, I should be grading them on documentation and the way that they have infused the research in their paper, not grammar, not punctuation, but the actual research that has been conducted, right? Uh, why do I, why is this important? Because we've got to make sure that assessment is aligned with our intended student learning outcome, right? Because what happens is, is that if I'm teaching students research papers, but I'm grading the paper based on grammar and punctuation and sentence structure, even though these things are important, but if I make them major themes while I'm grading the paper, then students who conducted good research still may fail. And that was not the original assignment. The assignment was to look at how well they researched. So it's just like if I'm going to a mechanic shop and I'm looking at um, how well the mechanic fixes the car, if the car is dirty, that doesn't have anything to do with how well the car runs. So I can't grade him on a basis of a criteria that was not involved in the first place. So we want to always make sure that our assessment of our students is aligned with the instructional focus. So before you, what you see right now is uh, a set of questions that are generic in nature, but really can apply to any assignment that we give. And the generic stems, and they are generic for the specific purpose that we wanna make sure that we're very, very repetitive in asking these questions. Because again, what we're trying to do is push our students to a place where they learn how to process information and critically think on their own. And that only comes through consistency and persistency. So we can be as repetitious as possible when asking these questions. What are the strengths and weaknesses of this, of this book? Uh, what is the difference between what the author says and what you believe? If you think that this is a, if you think that this author is uh, not presented a good argument, why is it not a good argument? Explain yourself. And so each time we're pointing the students in the direction of being more thoughtful about the opinions that they make. And so that is the essence of a critical thinker, the essence of a critical thinker. Another thing that we can do when promoting critical thinking and metacognition in our classrooms is we want to make sure that our students are writing. Why? Even if it's just note taking, right? We want to make sure that they're always writing, right? Not recording with their cell phones, not taking a picture of the board, but they're writing. I might uh, even incentivize. In fact, I did when I was teaching in the classroom, I would incentivize writing by giving students uh, extra credit points for uh, notes that they've taken in their folders, right? Not, again, not taking pictures of the board when I give the notes, but the notes that they actually take, I would incentivize it by giving them credit. Why is this writing so important? 
because writing converts students from passive learners to active learners. Now, not only am I writing down this information, but I'm engaging with what this lecture is. I'm having to process what it is that the teacher is saying by taking notes. So th three things are happening. Three things are happening when they're writing. Three things are happening. One, they are identifying issues. Two, they are formulating hypotheses, meaning they're making educated guesses, right? They're making educated guesses. And three, they are creating arguments. They are creating arguments because the act of writing itself requires students to focus and clarify what they think, feel, and believe. This is why we've seen so many universities start programs that they call writing across the curriculum, right? So writing is a very, very big part of the critical thinking process. So one tactic that I also like to use and encourage other teachers to use is maybe for the first five to 10 minutes of class, have the students keep a journal where they write a paragraph, right? A paragraph about what it is that we learned or discussed the day before. Not only is this bringing back information, but now you're bringing information back to the forefront of their mind that they can use to engage in the present class, right? And so you can incentivize this by um, giving them credit for the journal either at the end of the week, mid semester, end of the semester. And so that they know that writing is something that is part and parcel of the course. Okay, how can we steer our students? Uh, what are some other ways that we can steer our students in the direction of critically thinking about information when they read and when they study? I think it's important to provide students with a list of questions that they can ask a text, right? One of the very first things that I do when I start the semester um, in a classroom is I teach students how to read, right? because many of them have been taught how to recognize words, but the level of comprehension is not where it should be. So they have to be taught how to read, right? So I give them a list of questions that they can ask about any text. Um, what is the title? What does the author mean by this title? What information is presented here? What is the author trying to say? Um, how did how did I arrive at my how did I arrive at my opinion? What assumptions do I have about this text? What are some examples in the text that can validate what I think, feel, or believe? What do I not yet understand? What do I already know about this subject that can help me understand it? And so those are very very simple questions. But when asked enough, what happens is is that now. I'm getting my students to think a particular way when they learn how to process and dissect information. Lastly, I wanna give you a couple of suggestions for critical thinking activities, right? And these can be used in just about any class. They can be used in science, um, humanities, social sciences, whatever the class is, these activities can be used as a means to strengthen the critical thinking of our students. Number one, have students write about uh, unfamiliar points of view or what if scenarios, right? For example, let's say in a social sciences class, you may ask students, um, what if you were a mental health professional in a high school? what would be the thing that you would tackle in that school, right? What if you were a mental health professional in a high school? What would you do? How would you get the students to think about their mental health, right? So get the wheels turning. You're making them think about what they would do if they were in unusual situations. Number two, think of a controversy in your uh, program or specific area of focus and have students write a dialogue about it, right? We know a really, a really, really big uh, controversy right now is the whole idea of what is called critical race theory, right? So have your students write that, have your students write about 
why this is a controversy and why or why not they feel that it shouldn't be a controversy, right? What do they think the issue is that is making people so upset about this particular issue? Number three, find important articles in your area, in your, in your concentration, and ask the students to write abstracts of those. What it does is, even though they're sort of just giving you a short summary of something that they read, it's forcing them to read. It's forcing them to read. And so I thank you guys for your time. Um, I have a um, an ebook that I'm going to share with you in the comments. And I want to make sure that you understand that critical thinking and metacognition are two very important tools that are going to help our students, not only academically, but professionally. Enjoy your day.